for probably about the last 30 years, maybe only 20 if you're thinking about the doubling of the NIH budget in the 90s. Um, in the past 10 years, the federal research investment has not kept up with inflation. That's an old story. Uh, most of the agencies only caught up in 2020, except for DOD, which was ahead of the game. And ironically, it's because uh, during the Trump administration, the Republican-controlled Congress largely ignored the administration's budget proposals. Um, so I think it's, it's immediately clear we're going to see much more spending on research and education uh, in the Biden administration. Uh, if you look at what's been done to date in the American Rescue Act, uh, there was $600 million for NSF and about $400 million for the Department of Education, the National Endowment of the Humanities, and NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, if you look at the proposed infrastructure plan, it includes about 250 billion uh, in research and incorporates much of the uh, endless funds that have yeah. been proposed by uh, Senator Schumer and Young which calls for $100 million over five years for NSF and the creation of a new technology directorate. Even if that gets funded at $50 million, it will be a, a significant change. Um, I'm not gonna dissect those in detail, uh, but I think we can look at how they exemplify some of the themes and priorities of the Biden administration. And I'd list four of them in no particular order. Uh, one is certainly economic and uh, opportunity equity and inclusion. Uh, another is climate change, domestic manufacturing, and then technological competition and what we need to do to maintain the, the U.S. advantage there. Um, but, and, and I'll come up with some examples uh, to illustrate each of those. Uh, but I think it's worth looking at a couple of other things that perhaps overlay those. Uh, one is I think when the Democrats have been in power, they've had a historical predilection for more applied or problem di driven research. Uh, the Republicans have tended to see more applied programs leading to commercial deployment as corporate welfare. Of course, that's the old Republican party. Uh, who knows what the new one will think. Um, I think if you look at, at Biden's tendencies, he's tended to have a predilection for moonshots. And of course he was in charge of the cancer moonshot uh, in, the, in the Obama administration. I do think this administration has a greater recognition that we need a strong foundation in not just in higher education, but in our people in their education and training and in fundamental research. Um, if I look at some of those priorities, for example, under equity, uh, we see in several of these proposed pieces of legislation, uh, significant investments in historically black colleges and universities and minority serving institutions. Um, there are proposals in the infrastructure plan for investment in innovation hubs. These would be smaller cities sort of outside current powerhouses like Boston and Silicon Valley and probably Austin, Texas as well. Um, broadband for all is, is uh, another key theme. Uh, harks back to the administration of Franklin Roosevelt and the rural electric, electric, uh, electrification uh, administration. So I think COVID has taught us the importance uh, with students studying online, learning online of the importance of, of broadband access. Um, and then another thing that, that cuts across a number of priorities is what's being referred to as ARPA-H, where the H stands for health. The idea uh, is to sort of copy the ability of the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, and its clone under the uh, Obama administration, ARPA-E and Energy, and to set up similar organizations uh, in other agencies that will uh, allow a focus on problem solving and uh, research that, that leads to products and deployment. And clearly uh, health discrepancies uh, and um, you know, 
adequate health care for all, I think, will be an important theme uh, of whatever ARPA-H becomes. In climate change, there's also a proposal for an ARPA-C, uh, where C would be climate. Um, certainly large investments in clean energy technologies. Uh, in the Department of Energy, these include the Office of Science, but certainly the more applied uh, offices that are part of the Department of Energy as well. Uh, on infrastructure investments, you've seen the, the plans for deployment of a significant number of electric vehicle charging stations across the country. And we may not immediately think of it as the flip side of the coin, but uh, pulling back, uh, canceling the approval of the Keystone pipeline is an example of the administration making prior, uh, setting priorities about the kinds of energy infrastructure that they don't want to see built. Um, I think they're, they're probably also taking several lessons from the Obama administration. Um, you know, I think one thing to realize is that the penetration of clean tech today and going on in the near future was enabled significantly by early investments, uh, things like the uh, ARA, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act from 2009 and the Sunshot Program of DOE, uh, but also by tax and investment policies, um, you know, throughout the, the last decade or more. And I think having seen that historical time scale, I think it's important to realize that we should not judge the success of the investments that this administration is proposing on strictly a four year time scale. Uh, unfortunately, that is our electoral time scale. Uh, getting back to some of the priorities, if you look at manufacturing, manufacturing hubs, we have some, there will probably be more. The proposal for creating innovation hubs that I mentioned. Uh, there's a substantial increase proposed in the NIST budget to create manufacturing extension partnerships. Uh, in technology competitiveness, I think many of the things that we have been hearing uh, even from the previous administration in artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, quantum computing technologies, uh, those are going to continue to be at the, the forefront. Uh, I think there's a recognition that we need a larger and broader swath of our population engaged in and also benefiting from the investments that will be made in these priorities. And again, I'll remind you about the, the proposals for universal broadband access and the investments in higher education. Uh, and again, especially in HBCUs and minority serving institutions. Uh, I'll just close by saying, I think there's an important opportunity for universities to craft our messaging. Uh, if you look at some of the, the polls that the uh, Pew Foundation runs, uh, higher education tends to poll rather poorly. Uh, and people think of things like high costs and student loans that take forever to pay back and so forth. Uh, in contrast, if you look at some of the polls the AAU, the American Association of Universities have done, America's leading research universities polls very well. So I think the, the lesson for universities is that we need to emphasize really not only the, the contributions that we make through discoveries, but uh, the contributions by producing the people who will make tomorrow's discoveries. And also, as we think about the, the priorities of this administration and the things we ought to be doing ethically anyway, making sure that the people who will make tomorrow's discoveries uh, look like America uh, in the same vein as uh, the president's cabinet. So I think I got that in 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> And I'll, I'll hand the baton over to the next person. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Bartow, for your presentation. It was a nice um, overview on the historical analysis of the budget. Um, it's a lot to think about. Okay, so our next speaker is Professor Andrew Natsios, who is the director of the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs at AM's Bush School, where he is also an executive professor. He is a fellow of the Michael E. DeBakey Institute for Comparative Cardiovascular Science and Biomedical Devices, and served as Administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development for five years. In addition to this, Professor Natsios has overseen the pandemic and biosecurity program since 2014. Welcome, Professor Natsios, and thank you for being here. Thank you, and that program that you just mentioned is in the Scowcroft Institute. It's not 
in Washington. We started it some years ago because of my experiences with um, uh, the, the fear of a repetition of 1918, which happened uh, in 2005. President Bush was read the book, The Great Influenza of John Barry. We quite, became quite alarmed by it and required everybody in the cabinet to read the book and um, appropriated, got $7 billion through Congress in a, a supplemental appropriation to prepare for what did not happen while he was president, but did happen in 2009. The only reason we didn't have a repetition of 2009 in terms of mortality, in fact, no one even remembers we had a pandemic, but we did, but because the, the um, 1.9 billion people got the flu in six months. However, the mortality rates were among the lowest in recent history because the 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 uh, very vari the variant of the flu or the mutation of the flu that year was very very mild compared to most other years and so um, President Obama actually implemented the program that President and he said it publicly that President Bush put in place we all had to go to NI all the cabinet and sub cabinet had to go to NIH and sit and listen to President Bush give this 45 minute scientific lecture on why we were asking for the seven billion dollars what the risks were and how this was not gonna happen while he was president. And it was, it was very interesting um, how one book led to a $7 billion appropriation. Um, be careful what you write and who reads it. Um, so I am not an expert in uh, the science and technology policies of the US government but in any administration. However, I did spend the money in AID and I am familiar with what state did or did not do uh, in, in that field. Uh, when I was administrator, we actually uh, asked the National Academy of Science to do a research project. It was Rich Bissell, actually, who used to be the head of the s and Bureau at AID under President Reagan and then under President Bush, 41, who was uh, one of the senior executives of the National Science. He proposed to me privately and said, AID has a major role in science technology, which is not well known at all. Uh, and um, and so we need to review it and then see what we can do to enhance it. And so a report came out, I think it was in just after I, just before I left AID in 2006. Um, and it, it led Raj Shah, who was the aid administrator for much of the Obama administration to implement many of the recommendations. One of which was to increase dramatically the number of um, uh, senior fellows from, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the title. Uh, these are science and technology. These are PhDs uh, who are out of school, out of graduate school, and they, they come to AID in career slots. We had 12, uh, Raj increased it to 62, I think, to put more scientists in AID. These are, these are um, uh, what, it's the National Association of Scientists, I think. I'm trying to remember the title for these fellows. But anyway, uh, Raj put a lot more in AID and so they, and he appropriated more money for this. So what are the areas that AID has been involved in under uh, previous presidents and what I expect will uh, continue at a much more accelerated rate? I would be, this is not to critique uh, the vice president. I would never do that, of course. Critique, no, no sane person in AINM would critique anything that the vice president for research says. But that was supposed to be a joke, Mark. Um, uh, um, Feel free. All, <laughs> I have been in the federal government for almost 10 years. I was secretary of administration and finance in Massachusetts state government. So I was the chief operating officer, chief financial officer. The state budget in every, 50, every one of the 50 states and the federal level is proposed by the governor and the presidents, governors and president. And then they are sent to the legislature and the Congress and they're, they are dumped in the wastebasket. And that is not just an, under Trump, thank God, but it's also every president because Congress, of course, the house has to appropriate first and then the Senate appropriates and they have their own ideas of what to, 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 to spend money on. And, and sometimes they are the same, but presidents do lobby when they have major initiatives, so the, the Feed the Future Agricultural Initiative of the Obama administration, which I strongly supported, was a billion dollars a year. President Obama just didn't propose it. He had to go to Congress and, and get um, 
people in Congress to support it because they wouldn't have otherwise. President Bush tripled the aid budget while he was president. Some people argue this was all for Afghanistan and Iraq. That's nonsense, actually. It was mostly to Africa, actually. Uh, there was a massive increase from $1.2 billion to $8 billion in development assistance and health programs in Sub-Saharan Africa in almost every area of, uh, of health. We had a, a big initiative in, in uh, extending the internet to about 20 African countries that had no internet access at all, called the Last Mile Initiative. It was started by Mickey Leland from Houston, actually, a congressman who sadly died in a terrible train plane accident. I think literally when I joined the federal government in um, Bush 41, it was in, the, in the early 1989. And, um, uh, but after he died, I, I really became fascinated by this. So when I was the aid administrator, we picked that up and extended it um, substantially in Africa and then also in Afghanistan. Uh, there were a lot of a AID, uh, and Mark said this, and I just want to emphasize it. Uh, in, in foreign aid, the Republicans do support applied research, not in domestic. I, I, I have my own skepticism about um, uh, the, the value of it in some, with some corporations, but let's put that aside. Uh, the, um, in foreign uh, assistance, both parties, there's a consensus about applied research, not bench research. There is a huge bias in Congress against bench research, bench research being done by AID or state uh, in any science field uh, because they think it's ineffective and without going to all the details, there's a long history that goes back 30 or 40 years on this. And so I had some ideas to do bench research and this career staff said, Andrew, don't even propose it. You're not gonna get anywhere with it. So and without going through all of the things we spent, we spent you know, $40 million testing uh, zinc um, treatments for malnutrition, ch child, children who were malnourished. We did it on a large scale in uh, Bangladesh and Tanzania, it was proved to be very effective and it's now widely used around the world. Uh, there's also artemisinin combination therapy for malaria. That was also done through uh, WHO. They coordinated it. We funded it, sort of told them what to do, and, um, and other donors contributed, and that was tested, and that's widely used now, too, as a um, response to malaria. The, uh, I think one area that we're going to see a lot of money spent on but hopefully at some point the president will make a decision. It'll be controversial because no one will be happy with it on a, a, what I call a, a pandemic early warning system. I don't like the acronym PUSE. It is modeled, the, the, what I proposed in an article for foreign affairs in July of last year, I said we need a pandemic early warning system for infectious disease that could mutate into a worldwide pandemic. Um, and certainly uh, the, Ebola, for example, will never become a pandemic because it's, it's difficult to get it. And uh, I wouldn't have invested in, in pews being used for that purpose. But the idea was to use remote sensing from satellite photographs and ground uh, examination and uh, media and uh, social media to determine whether or not an outbreak is taking place, but an, under an autocratic government, there may be reluctance to make it public, which is what happened in China. There is a Harvard study that shows uh, substantial evidence that the pandemic actually started in late August, early September of 2019. I don't think the central government was even aware of it. Uh, and uh, they told, they got this from aerial photographs of an increase substantially in the number of people going to health clinics uh, in the greater Wuhan area beginning late August, early September. And uh, they looked at Twitter to see whether the, the, um, uh, the um, characteristics, the, the um, symptoms of COVID were appearing in Twitter and they were beginning at the same time period. So if you marry those two pieces of information, something was going on much earlier than what we now think. And WHO is now saying, yes, it started probably in, in November, I, I think the Harvard study suggests it's two months earlier than that. There will be a lot of money in the area of pandemic early warning system. The aid staff's already talked to me about it. They've issued a request for information 
And uh, Dr. Morano and I from the Borlaug Institute and I are working with um, uh, IIAD on potentially partnering with the University of California in San Diego on a response to this request for information at AID. I think it's 50 million now, but it is clearly, it doesn't say pandemic early warning, but that's what it is. I, I propose that it be centered in aid. There's a proposal that it, one be done internationally. There's another proposal for CDC to run it, another for the UN to create a new agency. And then there's one for the CIA to run it and another one for the DOD. So everybody's proposing it now, which means that it's, something's gonna happen. The question is we can't have all those agencies doing the same thing. Um, the, um, the amount of money that goes from AID universities for, for applied research is substantial, but it's concentrated in a few big universities and we're not one of them, unfortunately. Um, Johns Hopkins gets at least $300 million a year from AID and the School of Public Health to do a lot of their research. I signed off a whole bunch of grants and uh, contracts to uh, Johns Hopkins while I was there on HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis that later become, became the uh, Global Fund to do some early research for us. And they're still doing that now. So they have a, a, an established relationship and of course, uh, the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins is regarded as one of the finest in the world um, in international health, international health. And then finally, uh, uh, there will be, a, there's, there's, there was under Obama, a big focus on climate change. And uh, some people, Richard Zeckhauser at Harvard has proposed that they put less focus on that and more focus on mitigation because he argues that we are not gonna be successful in actually reducing greenhouse gases for a variety of reasons. He argued in one of the latest um, Harvard journals uh, that we should be putting a lot of money into mitigation. What can we do to prepare the world for what may well happen um, in the next few decades? So I, I think that will be one of the focuses in AID of mitigating the effects of climate change, for example, on agriculture and on water, hydrology. Um, and so those are my comments. Um, we do know that AID got huge amount of money and the supplemental that went through under, two that went through under Obama, uh, under uh, Trump, but he didn't put the money in, the Congress put the money. Lindsey Graham actually and Mitch McConnell were our big supporters of aid. He and uh, Senator Leahy were instrumental in the Senate to get it through. I can't remember who did it in the House, but. They just gave $2 billion to Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, and they've announced they're going to give another $2 billion. So $4 billion is a lot of money for Gavi. It's for the COVAX program to make vaccines available. There is now a coordinator in the administrator's office, Jeremy Conindite, to run the um, vaccine distribution campaign in the developing world, and AID will be apparently at the forefront of a lot of that distribution effort and logistics effort. And then I think 11% of the amount of money appropriated to deal with COVID-19 is being spent by AID and states. So there's a lot of money there to uh, do what President Obama, President Trump did not do, which is to focus attention on stopping the, uh, this virus from um, circulating because the longer it circulates, the more variants there are gonna be and the more mutations, which will result, of course, in potentially mutation we can't stop. Then we'll have a repetition of what just went on. It's, it's, it's very dangerous to let this virus running. It's much more unstable than we originally thought a year ago. And so um, getting everybody immunized all over the world is the only way in getting herd immunity to stop this from spreading. For, by the way, on April 22nd, we will have a national panel uh, state panel, a national panel that Jerry Parker has organized, the director of the, the Scowcroft Pandemic Program, on uh, vaccines and the variants and what we can do to speed this process up. I'm sorry, that's over 12 minutes. That's fine. I think just a little bit over. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing with us your wealth of knowledge on what has happened with government budgets and initiatives and what you think is going to happen in the future with the Biden administration.
So um, now our, to our third speaker, Dr. Will Thomas, a senior science policy analyst at the American Institute of Physics, where he currently writes for FYI, Science Policy News. He is the author of Rational Action, The Sciences of Policy in Britain and America, 1940 to 1960, and frequently covers topics of cutting edge research and policy matters. Welcome, Dr. Thomas, and thank you for being here. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, if you check out our website, uh, you can uh, see our updates um, several times a week, uh, oftentimes, uh, and you can sign up for our emails uh, totally for free too at the American Institute of Physics. Let me try and uh, share my screen here. Okay, uh, you can see that okay? So what I'd like to try and do is impress on you that we're actually at a really unusual moment in science policy, certainly uh, unusual as far as I've been covering it uh, over the last five years after becoming a policy analyst after previously being a historian like our next presenter, Audra. Uh, and what's fueling this moment is certainly, you know, the uh, Biden administration's economic policies, but in fact, most of the ideas uh, that we see right now are coming from Congress. And what we have are proposals circulating for R&D funding infusions. They could exceed $100 billion and even approach $250 billion, all told, if they're enacted. Uh, for reference, the annual budgets of agencies such as the National Science Foundation or the Department of Energy's Office of Science have budgets of about uh, 7 to $8 billion per year. Most unusually, uh, these policies are coupled to still much larger proposals to bolster U.S. manufacturing and infrastructure, uh, as part of an aggressive industrial and economic policy. Experienced players in science policy will be rightfully wary about these po uh, proposals prospects, but getting because getting things done in Congress is never easy. Nevertheless, there's reason to take them seriously, not least since these proposals have been brewing for some time and have considerable bipartisan support, which opens up additional pathways to their enactment that wouldn't necessarily be uh, blocked by a filibuster uh, or a refusal to use the budget reconciliation process like they just did with pandemic relief. So some brief historical background uh, to this moment. A lot of our cliches in science policy um, date back to the end of the Cold War when reducing federal spending was in vogue. And there was a sense among scientists that science wasn't well appreciated by politicians. So this is especially so among particle physicists who were scarred by the cancellation of the Texas-based superconducting supercollider in 1994. By the late 1990s, that picture was already outdated as re the Republican-controlled Congress and President Clinton agreed to double the budget of the National Institutes of Health over five years. One proposal at that time would have included NSF in that doubling, but it wasn't to be. Under George Bush, budgets, ge budgets generally got flat again, but during his second term, there was a new bipartisan rallying cry for higher science budgets, particularly in the physical sciences. The 2005 National Academy's report rising above the gathering storm was a catalyst there. The, budget, the Bush administration replied with what it called the American Competitiveness Initiative, and Congress came up with even more ambitious goals enacted through the America Competes Act of 2007. And after the financial crisis, things looked even better for the moment when there was a spike in federal funding through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. That post-crisis moment is not unlike the one uh, that we're in right now. Uh, then deficit reduction came into vogue uh, among congressional Republicans and the Budget Control Act of 2011 kept tight caps on government spending, including science budgets for the rest of the Obama administration. Importantly though, that austerity didn't disturb the essential fact that there was a broad good feeling towards science that continued to be bipartisan nature. And this became important during the Trump administration when Congress, including many Republicans, refused to entertain proposed budget cuts in fact, freed from Obama era deficit politics, they raised budget caps leading to significant funding increases for science. Here's a closer look where you can see uh, 2017, this is all normalized to that year uh, that uh, Trump administration, um, that Congress during that period raised budgets a lot more quickly than they did uh, during the latter years of the Obama administration. We'll come back to this chart later. And while science budgets generally did well, it was later in the Trump administration that we started to see stirrings of interest in doing something bigger. In November 2019, then Senate Minority, now Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer started publicly talking about a plan called the Endless Frontier Act 
to spend $100 billion over five years to expand NSF by bolting on a new directorate that would fund R&D in key technology areas. At that time, nobody knew how the 2020 election was going to turn out, and Schumer hinted he was looking to build bipartisan support for the idea. We learned some months later he was working with Republican Senator Todd Young of Indiana on it. But Young wasn't alone among Republicans. Notably, in 2019, Florida Senator Marco Rubio was openly talking about pursuing industrial policy, which is something that had previously been totally out of the question to free market-oriented Republicans. Uh, the emergence of China as a competitor to the US is a really key motivator for Republicans, as well as a number of Democrats. Uh, and I want to come back to that context uh, at the end. So in talking about R&D policy that's coupled to an industrial policy, we're really not talking about a sort of vague belief that raising funding is going to result in new inventions that make the US more prosperous. The enthusiasm here is for a more integrated policy that couples R&D with support for manufacturing and is regarded by its proponents as the necessary response to active Chinese government support for competing industries and for certain uh, technologies that are regarded as militarily critical. The reason for some of the price tags being bandied about are so large is that many of the projects being envisioned are full-blown technology demonstrations, which are considerably more expensive than bench level R&D. Uh, this image here shows an ongoing project at Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee to use 3D printing methods to create a working prototype of a small scale nuclear reactor. The idea behind demonstration projects and other forms of late stage R&D is that you're creating not just an invention, but an entire ecosystem to use the common lingo of uh, uh, technologies, associated engineering techniques, and a workforce with diverse skill sets needed to support the deployment and commercialization of technologies. Unlike in basic research, the tendency is to target specific areas. So now the areas that you'll run into all the time uh, in Congress, uh, in the administration, uh, the Trump administration, as well as the Biden administration are AI, quantum science, advanced manufacturing, biotechnology, 5G telecommunications, uh, energy technologies, uh, to name the most common examples. So uh, in addition to being pricey, demonstration projects can be high risk. As an example, after the 2009 stimulus, the Petronova carbon capture demonstration plant was built outside Houston with support from uh, DOE. However, that facility was recently closed because the economics of running it turned sour. Government can assume some of that risk to take advantage of the ecosystem building benefits that demonstrations yield, but you have to be willing to accept expensive failures. Increasingly, Congress has. Uh, we're talking nowadays about civilian R&D, but uh, um, momentum recently has been in defense R&D, uh, going back to the late years of the Obama administration. At that time, DOD, led by uh, physics-trained Defense Secretary Ash Carter, became concerned that US military competitiveness was eroding against so-called near peer adversaries such as China, uh, and that it was necessary to move much more quickly to bring experimental warfighting technologies into use. To do so, DOD proposed stepping up its prototyping and testing activities to learn about new technologies by building them and deploying them. This philosophy owed a lot to how software is developed in Silicon Valley and former Google CEO, Eric Schmidt, became an influential figure in pushing DOD in this direction. And he's remained a really influential figure and is actually one of the brains behind the Endless Frontier Act. Schumer's mentioned him once or twice in that context. So coming back to this chart, you can, if you look at the red line there, you can see that over the last five years, DOD's R&D test and evaluation budget has had a larger proportional increase than other government agencies. And if you talk about the actual budgets involved, they're humongous. Taking 2016 as a baseline, Congress has added a cumulative $120 billion to DOD's budget. That figure is comparable to the really earth-shaking proposals that are now on the table with other agencies. But this is something that's already been implemented. And it's actually something that the administrators at Texas A&M has been paying attention to. Right now, there's a huge construction project at the Rellis campus on the outskirts of College Station as the university uh, builds what's called the George H.W. Bush Combat Development Complex. It's a $200 million project with the Army contributing 65 million, the state uh, 50 million, and the university 85 million. And it's not early stage R&D, it's very much in this demonstration and testing vein of work that I've been talking about. And this in turn is attracting additional funding opportunities. 
Texas A&M was recently selected uh, as the headquarters for a new university consortium in hypersonics, which is one of the technologies DOD has been prioritizing under the Trump administration. And there's potentially more to come. Uh, on January 1st, Congress enacted the Chips for America Act, which is a bipartisan measure uh, supported by Texas Senator John Cornyn, among others, uh, to repatriate semiconductor manufacturing to the US. DOD has been worried about access to microelectronics and the security of the microelectronics components that it uses. Uh, and this is also a broader issue for the US economy as highlighted by a recent worldwide microchip shortage that has had a severe impact on auto manufacturing. The CHIPS Act authorizes subsidies for semiconductor manufacturing facilities, but also R&D efforts. A key shortcoming of current US-based manufacturing vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan is an ability to fabricate chips at the smallest nanoscales. So you need R&D to keep capabilities current. The CHIPS Act does not provide funding for its initiatives, which would be upwards of $30 billion. But that funding is something that could easily find its way into the next spending deal because there's a lot of bipartisan support for it. In this video still, Senator Cornyn and Representative Mike McCall are coming from an Oval Office meeting on the issue. And shortly thereafter, President Biden publicly spoke in favor of providing that funding. So continue to watch this space. And that's just one example of developments that are really unusual in science policy. And at AIP, we've been following them closely over the last few months, as there are many proposals that are flying around and it's not yet at all clear what'll move forward and how. So, Wrapping up, I'd like to uh, change pace a little bit and say a few words about the context of competition with China that is motivating a lot of these proposals right now. Some of it is about straightforward competition and spending and the need to stay ahead, so to speak. But another component of this is concerns about IP theft and espionage. And this has led to dozens of scientists with ties to China, China, uh, with ties to China being either arrested or fired. Uh, including Texas A&M professor Zhen Dong Chen last summer, who was arrested at that time uh, for work that he was doing with NASA for concealing uh, connections to China. And in many cases, uh, these have not been, these people have not been accused of theft or espionage per se, but rather just simply not letting their funders in the government know about their connection to Chinese institutions and talent recruitment programs, which uh, the FBI and the Department of Justice have charged as fraud. And this has led to serious concerns that prosecutors are mistakenly targeting activities that are part of the open exchange of research, that research collaborations with Chinese institutions are being subtly or not so subtly discouraged, and also that Asian and Asian American researchers and students are being racially profiled, which is a problem that is especially sensitive given the recent rise in bigotry and violence against Asians. Although we might expect some changes under the Biden administration, uh, this was an initiative championed by FBI Director Christopher Wray, whom Biden has retained, and we can expect this to be a troublesome issue going forward. We should also note that we stand at a particularly uncertain moment uh, in U.S. higher education. Students from China have been by far the largest group of international visitors to the U.S., but after disruption in inter international travel brought about by the pandemic, we might wonder, given current tensions, whether things will look radically different in the years ahead. So if we seem to be on the cusp of a rather remarkable moment in science policy with potentially tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars in new funding, it's also a moment that's taking place in a really volatile context that we have to keep very careful tabs on. So that is uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. So Thomas, for your analysis and what is going to motivate where this budget is going to be spent on. So now to our final speaker, Dr. Audra Wolf, an award-winning historian of science. She is the author of notable works like Freedom's Laboratory, The Cold War Struggle for the Soul of Science, and Competing with the Soviets, Science, Technology, and the State in Cold War America. She is a frequent commenter on the nexus of science and U.S. politics. Welcome, Dr. Wolf. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Uh, before I get into my remarks, I do want to um, acknowledge the shooting of Dante Wright outside of Minneapolis this weekend. Um, I know that it's extraordinarily difficult to concentrate on professional issues in the midst of so much racism and sen senseless killing in this country. And so I just want to acknowledge this and recognize that um, science policy may not be the first thing on everybody's mind this afternoon. But so I want to thank you for joining us regardless. So for the topic at hand, 
Um, I actually want to begin my comments as the last speaker by questioning the underlying premise of much of the discussion that we've had so far, uh, which is that science and technology policy equals policy for research and development. And the, the idea that these two are one and the same has really been a commonplace in US science policy really since the end of World War II and Beniever's Bush, Beniever Bush's comments in Science, the Endless Frontier. This idea that funding research will um, produce applied things that will be useful, that will drive economic prosperity, that will uh, you know, drive military might, uh, all of this stuff. And of course, US science policy has undergone, has undergone tremendous transformation since 1945. It was never as simple as give money to the linear model and you know, miraculously get applications. But this way that we talk about um, science policy as being nearly equivalent to uh, both research policy and specifically funding for research policy lingers on. Uh, maybe it's because Americans you know, so often assume that money equals power. Our instincts are really to think about impact through the lens of spending. And so, of course, we've heard a lot about various kinds of spending policies, both in, under the past administration and possibilities for the future administration so far. But of course, as both Dr. Natsios and Dr. Thomas have reminded us, it's Congress that holds the powers of the purse. So if we really want to think about what possible dramatic changes are when we're thinking about uh, changes between presidential administrations, we would really do well to look beyond funding levels and think about um, the executive branch, think about the executive, um, the executive functions. So thinking about the, the staffing, thinking about the rule making processes of the various uh, executive agencies that carry out the day-to-day -day work of government, everything from uh, NASA and USAID to the DOE and the EPA. Um, and as well to think about the policy making entities within the White House that set the agenda for the rest of the government. Um, and so in science and technology policy, you often see these, um, these kinds of acts uh, in executive orders, in administrative rulemaking, and of course, in the makeup of science advisory boards, who's appointed to these boards has a, a lot of influence over what happens in these, in these various agencies. So, you know, President Trump famously eliminated many of the executive brand, many of the executive agencies' external science advisory boards, or, or, or alternatively raised barriers for participation for sci for academic scientists in particular to participate on those boards. Um, I think in the public discussion, in part just because of the, um, you know, how impossible it was to miss the impact of the COVID nineteen uh, COVID nineteen epidemic. A lot of the public discussion of the Trump administration's science policies has really focused on its active rejection of scientific consensus. But I would argue that the more telling trend has actually been in the vacuum of scientific information. Uh, the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is typically referred to as OSTEP, OSTEP actually lacked a director for the first two years of the Trump administration. And by the time that the pandemic broke, career scientists had been leaving the federal agencies in droves, uh, kind of across the board, uh, particularly in the Department of Agriculture, but, but also at the EPA and several others as well. Um, other policies, like the EPA's so-called transparency rule, uh, made it harder or proposed to make it harder. The, the transparency rule isn't actually happening, but these policies made it harder uh, for federal agencies to incorporate independent scientific data into their rulemaking practices. And so the cumulative effect of all of this wasn't so much to interfere with or override scientific findings, although that did happen on occasion. Um, the more, more commonly, it was to eliminate scientific expertise or reduce the, the presence of scientific expertise on any number of topics um, throughout the government that involve, scientific, uh, that involve scientific issues, regardless of whether there are areas that we might or might not think of as research policy. So I think all of this is useful background for making sense of Biden's phrase that he frequently said during the election, which was listen to the scientists. Because that sentence is actually fairly ambiguous. Listen to the scientists could mean do what the scientists say, or listen to the scientists could mean hear what the, hear what the scientists say before other people make decisions, right? That, that the people who are making the decisions need to hear from the scientists. And you could see this tension, this kind of ambiguity uh, in some of the endorsements of uh, now President Biden leading up to the election, particularly from within the scientific establishment. 
Um, so for example, when Nature endorsed uh, candidate Biden, it urged its readers to vote for Biden to restore the place of scientific and technical expertise within American institutions. So it specifically talked about the damage to scientific institutions. Uh, and it talked about the purge of scientific expertise within the government. Now at the other end of the spectrum was the endorsement from Scientific American. Um, and so instead of cataloging the, danger, the damages to American scientific institutions, um, the endorsement in Scientific American really talked about how the Trump administration's science policies hurt the public at large, uh, with COVID-19 obviously being the most telling example, but uh, through hurricane policy, various policies on the economy or the environment. So I would see these two ways of thinking about science as being at other ends of the spectrum um, of on the one hand saying to trust science and on the other hand to be guided by science. And you know, one really implies restoring scientists ability to work as autonomous professionals within the government. Whereas the other implied that the Biden administration would take scientist advice into consideration along with other factors, including our obligations to one another and to the planet. And so really what's at stake here is about the relationship between expertise and democracy. It's a question of whether experts make decisions or whether experts give advice to other people who make decisions on behalf of the public. So what I wanna emphasize here is that when you limit your definitions of science policy to questions about research policy, you're focusing on the outcomes for experts. But there's an alternative way of thinking about science policy that emphasizes how much these matters of science and technology affect every single person living in this country and arguably um, around the world. So now that we're three months in, we're starting to get a better sense of what the Biden administration thinks this means. <laughs> and it's become, a it's become fairly clear that Biden seems to be taking the second path, arguing that scientific expertise is essential but not sufficient for policymaking about science in a democracy. And two places where you really, I think two particularly striking moments where you start to see the shifts in what science policy mean um, have both taken place within OSTEP. Uh, the first was that Biden elevated the position of OSTEP director to a cabinet level position. So ensuring that the scientific perspective has a place at the table uh, for these major decisions, and this is new. The second decision, I think, was more innovative and indicative of a potentially radically different approach to science within the administration. And this was the, appoint of so this was the appointment of sociologist of science, Alondra Nelson, uh, to the position of deputy director uh, for science and society. So to my knowledge, over the course of its existence, neither OSTEP nor its associated uh, Presidential Scientific Advisory Council, they've never had a science studies scholar in a senior leadership position. So let me put this another way. So OSTEP, which is the body that sets science policy for the White House and hence for the country, has always been led by scientists instead of people with formal expertise on the relationship between science and society. So, you know, OSTEP has an enormous task ahead of it at this point. Um, in his less than three months in office, Biden has so far issued more than 50 executive actions of one kind or another many of them directly reverse policies that were put in place by the Trump administration, and several of them deal directly with science and technology issues. Uh, for science policy, one of the most important is a relatively obscure document. It doesn't have a particularly uh, exciting name, but it's called the Memorandum on Restoring Trust in Government Through Scientific Integrity and Evidence-Based Policymaking. And this EO, even though it has this, this fairly boring, cumbersome name, um, it's really important in terms of thinking about the role of science throughout the government. It outlines procedures to rebuild the scientific advisory councils, which is going to be essential to restoring um, that advice giving process. But it also establishes an interagency task force to conduct a thorough review of the effectiveness of um, scientific integrity policies throughout the government. And one of the things that's really interesting about this process is that it's not just meant to be a fact-finding operation about what happened under the Trump administration, but rather an opportunity to really um, explore and reflect on what scientific integrity means in the first place within a democracy. So the task force is up and running as of two weeks ago uh, in the letter uh, that was announced its establishment. Uh, it states that the body is really gonna focus on four key points. The first is, uh, what they call preventing improper political interference. 
Uh, the second is preventing the suppression or distortion of scientific and technological findings. The third is supporting researchers of all genders, races, ethnicities, and backgrounds, so basically diversity initiatives. And the fourth is to um, ensure an equitable delivery of federal programs, so thinking about the impact, not just the intent of programs involving science. So it's obviously too early to say what's going to come of this task force or this slew of EOs or even what's going to come of having a uh, science studies scholar in the White House. Um, but it does seem abundantly clear already that the Biden administration is committed to a vision of science policy that places the relationship of science and society on equal footing with research policy. That's exciting and it's new and it's going to have a dramatic effect on how we talk about science policy well into the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that fascinating perspective. That's very different from our previous speakers. So I'd like to thank all of our four speakers again. Those four presentations certainly touched upon a variety of topics, and I'm sure our audience will want to discuss some of these ideas with you. At this time, we'd like to open up the floor to live questions. So please feel free to unmute your mic at this time and um, ask any, any question you'd like. Okay, so we have some set questions from our survey. And the first one is for, for any of you to answer, in 2024, what would a successful SNT policy have accomplished in, in your individual opinions? Well, I'll just say something in terms of a non-money approach. Uh, we clearly have a, um, problem in this country with, with trust in science. <laughs> and it would seem to me that having um, kind of ongoing public conversations that recognize that science um, has effects on all the public um, is a really critical first step to restoring that trust. Um, so to me, that would be phenomenally successful if we could get to a point where um, the, the public is willing to uh, kind of recognize that there is a thing as scientific expertise uh, that has bearing on issues that are concerned to the populace, even while um, at the same time scientists come to um, recognize in a more public function that they're not always going to be the deciders about issues involving science and technology. I think if we can move that conversation along in both directions, um, that would be a, a phenomenally successful science policy. Yeah, thank you. So if I can jump in, I, I agree, although I, I not sure scientists have ever been the deciders, uh, much to their chagrin. Uh, but I, <laughs> as, as an engineer, um, I don't think the world should be run by engineers, I assure you. Um, but I, 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 you know, I alluded to it earlier about the, the time it actually takes to realize progress. So, you know, we have to look at it as a journey, not a destination. And hopefully the kinds of things that, that Dr. Wolf was just talking about, greater respect for science, greater uh, appreciation of science in the uh, portfolio of, of concerns that decision makers have to take into account, um, will you know, have made a step change uh, four years from now. Uh, but that certainly won't be an end point. I have a question for the panel. So this is Narsim Reddy, professor in uh, electrical engineering. So it seems like the government is moving towards a uh, consortium model where universities and industries work together. Uh, only exam, successful example I could think of is this thing called MCC that uh, government and industry put together for semiconductor manufacturing about 30, 40 years ago that has led to the enormous growth of semiconductor industry. Can you think of other examples where uh, industry and, and uh, government and universities work together to establish or grow on other types of industries? Yeah, I mean, that's really kind of the, the order of the day. I mean, just about everything you see is for one kind of public-private partnership or another. So NSF and DOE, for example, have been building these uh, institutes for artificial uh, intelligence and quantum information science that are explicitly built around these kinds of partnerships. Uh, the Manufacturing USA Institutes um, are less 
integrated with the academic world and maybe a little bit closer with the industrial world, but that's another area that people are looking at. The Trump administration really targeted those for cutbacks, but they weren't cut back and now they're all the rage again. And so, I mean, uh, energy is uh, a huge area, demonstration projects like I was talking about. And that's uh, been uh, bipartisan. The Energy Act of 2020, which was just passed uh, at the end of last year, uh, is calls for very much that sort of thing. So you should be seeing it all over the place, really. And certainly uh, semiconductors is a, a huge area, as you say. We, uh, when I was the aid administrator in early 2001, just after I took over, approved what's called the Global Development Alliance. Um, I wrote an article for the Stanford, so Stanford Social Innovations Review, which is the business, journal, the business school journal at Stanford about the GDA and what it was is public-private partnerships for development between AID, NGOs, foundations, and private industry. And uh, it took a while to get the career staff, which are very risk averse. In fact, that's one of the limitations of the federal government. Uh, if you're expecting great innovation from the federal government, I would be, be, you might be disappointed. It has worked when there's a national crisis like World War II with the atomic bomb, like um, the vaccine development, which was a, the, the one great success story of the Trump administration with respect to the pandemic is the vaccine program. It was hugely successful. And um, Graham Allison, who's no friend, friend of Donald Trump, wrote an article for the, uh, the Wall Street Journal saying as much, saying that they may have screwed everything else up, but this, they did a, they did a remarkable job of uh, bringing industry. I think industry mitigates some of the, um, dysfunctional political pressures that are on, uh, that, that distort decision-making sometimes in the federal government. Because industry just won't participate in it because it's not profitable if, it, if they think it's just politically driven. But anyway, the GDA, at the time that I stopped tracking it, which was 12 years ago, it was up to $20 billion. It's not a small amount of money. We expected it to be 50% AID, 50% private industry. It was 25% AID, 75% private money. And most of it for, was from industry. Now, a lot of big technology companies, uh, very interesting projects. I'm not gonna go into them now, but um, they were not, they were, there was some applied research, but the, most of it was the, the rolling out of projects into the field that worked into the supply chains of these companies. And uh, some of the companies said, why are you just doing it with them? I said, we'll do it with you if you give us the money or you, actually, we didn't actually give them money. They didn't give us money. We invested the money simultaneously in a mutually agreed on program. And then we would manage the process and the institutions running it to make sure it was on track. But my point here is there is a long history of public private alliances in AID that goes back almost 20 years now. And it, it's one of, and it's now integrated into almost every contract and RFP and RFA, RFI that you see. It's, there's always a line. There has to be some public-private alliance um, uh, element to these uh, programs. So I would make two points. Uh, one is I think an important component of these is to give uh, the members of the consortium a fair amount of latitude uh, if I think back to the Advanced Technology Center program that NIST used to run uh, and trying to engage companies, the response was often, if we thought it were that important, we'd spend our own money. Uh, the, the strings attached aren't worth uh, the money that the government provides. Uh, the other point I would make is that, um, you know, when the government plays venture capitalists, the, the politicians need to realize the success of most venture capital investments. Uh, and some of them aren't going to pay off. Uh, and, you know, when the Congress expects 100% success rate and, you know, Solyndra becomes almost as big a deal as Benghazi, uh, then I think that that really uh, inhibits, um, you know, some, some very worthwhile investments in um, sort of long range technology development. Um, I just I, add, the, 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 Congress is part of the problem, Mark, you're correct. 
the biggest problem is not the Congress. It's the IG office. It's the GAO. It's the o OMB. Uh, it's what's called the counter bureaucracy. Political scientists actually have a term for it. It's the federal systems used by successive presidents of both parties to control the federal bureaucracy. I wrote an article called The Class of the Counter Clash of the Counter Bureaucracy and Development that was written for the uh, Center for Global Development, the think tank on development policy in Washington. It is the most read thing they've ever, and they've done thousands of articles, much to my shock. I, my, my graduate student at Georgetown said, Professor, this is very boring. No one's going to read it. It's the most quoted thing I've ever written. I think it's at 275 site citations. Um, and because no one had written anything as to why AID is so risk adverse. And I said, well, here, here's, the, here's an explanation for it. And, it, 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 and, it, and it's not easy to fix. Raja tried to fix it by forcing the system, but he never changed the perverse incentives at work. And it's almost impossible. You cannot constrain the IG or the GAO or OMB. You can't do it. And, and until they can be constrained, there's going to be a huge disincentive to take risks. There any more questions? So it is now 4.34. So and that about wraps up our time. Thanks again to our speakers and our sponsors and to you, our audience members. These events are not possible without your gifts of time and participation. So thank you very much.